Thank you for all that, and uh, boy, our, uh, everything, but certainly our songs uh, tonight have uh, paved the well and lent themselves well to our study in First Thessalonians, and so that's exciting uh, to plug that in as well. Let's uh, pray together, and we'll stop, look, and listen. God, every time we enter into your gates, we do so with rejoicing in our hearts, and once again, we testify this, been a blessed evening, and we, we've sung uh, songs that have all been tied together under a particular theme. They've prompted us to lift our heads up from the trials and tribulations of this life and to do so in anticipation of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, that fits perfectly with where we are at in our study of 1 Thessalonians. So as we have the privilege again tonight to spend a few precious moments together in our corporate study of the Word of God, we would ask that you would be our help, that once again our eyes and hearts would be open and cultivated and ready to receive your truth. And uh, we, we pray this prayer again in the name of Christ and for his sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we have come in our study of 1 Thessalonians, as you know, to the classic text dealing with the rapture, the imminent return of Christ to rapture the church. I'm speaking of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. We are uh, choosing to read the text at the beginning of each of our sessions with a view to that aiding us and committing the text to memory. So I'll continue to challenge you in regard to that as well. And I realize, uh, again, we have a number of translations that are used, and, and I realize that there can be some frustration in regard to that. But, uh, but uh, please embrace this challenge, and let's uh, hide these words um, in, in our hearts. Take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, as I read. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do believe that, even so them also who sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and this is our favorite part, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, before we get to exegeting the text and by way of introduction, we are defining a couple of terms that we invariably use when we talk about the rapture, these terms especially um, dealing with the timing of the rapture. And those two terms are uh, the terms imminent and pre-tribulational. Uh, the last time that we were together, we talked about the word imminent and... Um, I have one left over for you in regard to that term before we go on and talk about uh, the word pre-tribulational. So would you for a few moments tonight think again with me about this wonderful term imminent or the um, imminency in regard to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. To state it clearly as it relates to even our statement of faith here at Calvary Baptist Church, we believe in the imminent pre-tribulational rapture of the church. We are imminent pre-tribulational rapturists, just in case you wanted to know. And by the way, we would have it no other way. And by the way, we are and will continue to be in the process of seeing the biblical warrant for being an imminent pre-tribulational rapturous, and that is obviously very, very important. I remind, I remind you, first of all, basically, that the idea of uh, 
uh, of uh, the imminent return of Christ is that it could happen at any moment. It is interesting as we listen to the songs we sing. I will, by the way, be coming back to one song that we often sing, and I don't do this off, uh, very often, but offering to you a biblical critique of it. But by far, most of the songs that we sing, if you look very carefully at them, you realize that you are singing not only about the rapture of the church, but you are singing about a pre-tribulational rapture of the church, and you're not only singing about a pre-tribulational rapture, but you are singing about an imminent pre-tribulational rapture of the church. In other words, we even sing about the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is poised and ready to return, and that return could happen at any moment. By the way, I'll give you something else to chew on, and this is, uh, this is more for me than you. And I've alluded to this before, but we will reference it uh, time and time again as we hover over this classic text dealing with the rapture of the church. We, um, we so easily say to each other and, and we so easily sing what um, appears to be our heart's desire and that is even so come Lord Jesus. But there is a piercing question in regard to that. And the piercing question deserves our silent, solemn reflection. And the piercing question is, do you really want him to return tonight? It is interesting, and I've referenced this before, and this is a critique not on you, but on, I guess, the country western world, and a number of people have sung the song, and I don't particularly listen to that, but I've heard this song sung, and every time I, I do it stirs my heart because I think that it probably marks the majority of God's people. And the song goes something like this. I'm not going to sing, so stay put. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go now. And I'm just wondering how many of God's people are actually marked by that. Now, you and I wouldn't admit that to each other. But I wonder how many of God's people are marked by that sentiment. And so, and, and again, it's primarily for me, but as I uh, study, as I run a little bit ahead of you in regard to this classic text, that's one of the things that God keeps pressing upon my heart and mind. And so I appreciate that, a significant challenge. I, I, I want to face it, and I certainly, with God's help, want to have a, a good and God-honoring answer for that. The imminent return of Christ, it could happen at any moment. We said that other things may happen, and that's obvious because the return of Christ has been imminent since the days of the Apostle Paul. We we said that um, other things may happen, but nothing on God's prophetic timetable has to happen in order for the rapture of the church. We said last time that imminency is established in the word of God in a deep and a wide way. We said it like this, that you could turn to literally dozens of texts which set forth the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last time we were together on this, we cited one tonight. I'd like to share another with you. So you're turning with me to James chapter 5. We're going to be reading verses 7 through 9. Again, this word imminent, fact that the Lord Jesus Christ could return at any moment. James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, as you, 7, 8, and 9, as you get there and before I read I will note with you that uh, this is a rehearsal I want you to know that we've been here before and the picture that we have here and what I'm going to remind you of is just that a reminder James chapter 5 verses 7 through 9 man I love this be patient therefore brethren unto the coming of the Lord behold the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth near. 
Murmur not one against another. Where did that come from, brethren? Lest ye be judged. Behold, the judge stands before the door. What an amazing picture. What, a, what an amazing portrait is here painted for us. I, I remind you of something. You probably remember this from when we were here before. That the key verbs in verses 8 and 9... Uh, the, the, the verb draweth near in verse 8 and the verb standeth in verse 9 are in the Greek in the perfect tense. You may recall, and I remember learning this for the first time in my Greek class, and I'll never, uh, I'll never forget this, that the perfect tense speaks of past action with abiding results. Now, um, you may have scholars express that to you a little bit differently, but that's uh, what has been written on the fleshly tablet of my heart. I love looking for uh, those things that are in the perfect tense because that's about as good as, it's, as it gets. Something that's been established in the past, but it has ongoing and often um, eternal uh, and, and abiding results, which is uh, a most wonderful thing. So the perfect tense speaks of action that was completed in the past in this case before James actually wrote his epistle. In other words, James is writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, and as he writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, these pictures have already been in place. I didn't express that to you well. I hope I did better the first time. Action that continues on a completed state. What is that? Christ's coming. Listen, this is so neat. Christ's coming, his return, the rapture, had already drawn near at the time of James' writing. James is writing, and as he writes, this is already in place. The coming of the Lord had already drawn near. And abiding results or continuing action, it had already drawn near, and it continued to be in that state through the James day, and it continues to be in, this, in that state through our day. The coming of the Lord has already drawn near. That is in place. The other picture is even a little bit more depictive. Christ the judge. I'm referencing now verse 9. Christ the judge began to stand before or in the doorway. You may recall that we tried to illustrate that. Christ the judge began to stand before or in the doorway before James wrote his epistle, and he continues to stand there. We have all kinds of uh, pictures and portraits of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know that as it relates to his, um, to his embodiment, that he's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, and he's ever living to make intercession for us. But I love some of the other pictures that God paints, and here's one. Christ, he, he's standing in the doorway. You see that picture and you can't help but envision that at any moment he is going to step through. By the way, this is kind of neat and it's just a, a, a side note in regard to James. James was a half brother to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Which means that he was waiting for his brother to come. Kind of a neat thing. By the way, I don't want you to misunderstand that James absolutely knew who the Lord Jesus Christ was. Remember early on he didn't believe in Christ, didn't believe him to be the Messiah, didn't believe him to be the eternally begotten Son of God. But God continued to womb, of course, and then he arrived at the place where, where, where uh, he not only embraced all that, but James, as you know, became a pillar uh, in, in the early church, and so the whole thing is absolutely awesome. So here in James uh, chapter 5, verses 7 through 9, we have a full and beautiful picture of imminency. Now, w one other thing about the word imminent, and this will serve as a good segue into our considering probably next time the word pre-tribulation, and we're certainly looking forward to that as well. And then we begin to exegete, and oh, wow. How exciting. I'm reminding you that what lies at the heart of imminency is this. 
fact that the imminent event could happen at any moment. We said it like this last time, that if anything has to happen before the imminent event, then the event is simply not imminent. May I say that again? If anything has to happen before the imminent event, then the event is simply not imminent. Here's my point, and it's a very, very significant one. Imminency demands a pre-tribulational rapture. I'm saying that again. Imminency demands a pre-tribulational rapture. That is, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ to rapture the church must take place before the start of the tribulation period. If it doesn't take place before the start of the tribulation period, it is not imminent. And the reason why it's not imminent is because that would mean that the judgments that take place at the beginning of the tribulation period, which Christ himself spoke of in Matthew 24, and John the Revelator spoke of in Revelation chapter 6, would of necessity have to take place before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if those things which are on God's prophetic timetable must take place before the tribulational period, then you can't have a pre-tribulational rapture. You can't have an imminent return of Christ. Did you follow that? I'm not sure that I did. Actually, I did. If part of the tribulation period, may I say it in Tommy Till language? If part of the tribulation period has to take place before the return of Christ, then the return of Christ is not imminent. So if you have imminency, listen class, if you've got imminency, if you have biblical warrant for the imminent return of Christ, the imminent return of Christ to rapture the church, then you have, this is amazing to me, all the biblical warrant you need to be a pre-tribulational rapturist. Now, as our study continues, and as next week especially, we talk a little bit more about the, rap, uh, about the pre-tribulational rapture, focus in on that word, we're going to find not only next week, but then throughout the course of our exegeting through this classic text, dealing with the rapture of the church, we're going to find and, and glean from Scripture many biblical reasons for our believing in a pre-tribulational rapture of the church. But I'm telling you tonight, and this is exciting to me, that if all you had was imminency, then you would have all you need to be confidently a pre-tribulational rapturist. If I'm stating it again, forgive me, this is for me, not you. You guys are so good. I got to go over it again and again. Listen, if part of the tribulation has to unfold before Christ's return, then Christ's return is not imminent. So if you've got imminency, if you can turn in the pages of Scripture, especially in this case the New Testament um, pages of scripture, if you can turn in the New Testament pages of scripture and you can glean the principle of imminency in regard to the return of Christ, and wow, you've got something. And again, I, I'm excited about that. You know what you got if you don't have that? Hmm. Did I say that right? You know what you got if you don't have that? You know what, I, what you and I would be left with if we didn't have the imminent return of Christ? If his return wasn't imminent? If portions of the tribulation period of necessity per God's design and plan had to take place before the return of Christ, you know what we would have then? We would no longer be looking for, and you know this well, we'd no longer be looking for the Christ. We would be anticipating the coming of the Antichrist. We'd no longer be looking to heaven for the Christ. We would be looking to the earth for the Antichrist. 
we'd no longer be anticipating the spending, um, uh, spending our time in the glory of heaven, but rather our anticipation would be that we would be suffering through the tribulation on this earth. Now listen, I'll probably say this again in just a moment as we complete our thoughts. But God could do it any way that he wanted to do it. You've heard this from me before in different settings. This is important. God could do it any way that he wanted to do it, but he's got to do it the way that he said he was going to do it. So if he's established imminency, you've got something. And I... I am glad. Now let me um, set the stage for next week as we allow that to be a good segue into, uh, as we rehearse the word imminent and we allow that to be a good segue into our considering the word pre-tribulational. We've been throwing words around, right? And again, it's kind of neat. You guys have a good hand on this. I don't need to be concerned. And, and even though some of the words are big, man, uh, we, we have a good understanding and, and and when everything is said and done God God really lays it out for us there are primarily three views I'll reference a fourth and there's actually a there, there's actually a fifth as well I don't want you to be confused about that when, when you talk about the rapture of the church you're primarily talking about three particular views the pre-tribulational rapture of the church that's what we are here at Calvary that means that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come before the tribulation period. When we talk about the tribulation period, we're talking about, and this takes us back into the Old Testament and the prophetic writings of Daniel and Ezekiel and others, Jeremiah. When, when we talk about the tribulation period, we're talking about that seven-year period of time, listen, when God pours his wrath upon the earth dweller. A pre-tribulationalist believes that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return and rapture the church before the tribulation period unfolds. A mid-tribulational rapturist believes that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back at the midpoint of the tribulation period. For you prophetic scholars, you will know that, that's, uh, that that is uh, the abomination of desolation which means that the church enters into the tribulation period and actually suffers through the wrath of God for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. And then at the midpoint, the Lord Jesus Christ returns and raptures the church. The post-tribulationalist believes that the church actually not only enters the tribulation period, but that the church is in place. You are in place throughout the entire course of the seven-year tribulation period, which I remind you again is the time when God pours his wrath upon the earth dwellers. By the way, I'm not being smart, smarty aleck, but what in the world would you be doing here during that time? What happened to your bridegroom? Oh, I can't wait to talk to you about these things. How wonderful. I told you I'd state it again in the end. God can do it any way that he wants. But he's got to do it the way that he said he would do it. And so if the word of God sets forth the imminent pre-tribulational rapture of the church, then you have every reason to not only embrace that, but to allow that to order your life. Much more to come. Oh, it's going to be good. Lord, thank you for these considerations. We love our study, and boy, we have arrived at a very, very special place in the Word of God. We often cite it as the classic text dealing with the rapture of the church, and you speak of the rapture in other places, of course. But wow, this is the text. And we're uh, excited and anxious about exegeting through it. I will say even in this prayer that as familiar as we are with the text, I, I know that you're going to be turning the light on for us and that we're going to be seeing things and being reminded of things that perhaps we have uh, let slip. 
And I would say broadly, too, in this prayer, it's amazing, and I'm certainly not reflecting on your people in this place because they are good. But in regard to Christendom, it's amazing to me how confused God's people continue to be about the rapture of the church. And so, God, we want you to instruct us, and we want you to remind us, and ultimately we want to be on our toes spiritually, anticipating the return of Christ. And with a view to the word imminent that we've emphasized again tonight, oh God, that we would day by day, every day, be conscious of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is poised and ready to return. He's standing in the door. He will walk through at any moment. And when he does, he'll be here to rapture his church. What a day as we have sung that will be but it's crucial that we're living our lives with a view to that day help us we pray in jesus name amen